After the overwhelming success of Sgt. Pepper and a massive smash with the success of All You Need Is Love on the r Road program, the Beals really moved past all their 1966 struggles and reclaimed their throne. Once you achieve all their goals though, you then question, what's next? Leave it to George Harrison to come up with a new direction which was to meet a huge Indian guru named Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. This guy would undoubtedly have one of the largest influences on the Beals, really the rest of their career. After the group attended a lecture of his in Wales, they were met with news that would change Beals' history forever. Well, I don't know what to say, you know, we've only just heard and it's hard to think of things to say. But he was just a beautiful fella, you know, and it's terrible. Yup, the Beals' manager, Brian Epstein, was now dead. His death is a mystery, even to this day, but the most well-known explanation was that he simply overdosed on a sleeping pill, which might have been caused by taking it with alcohol, a beverage that's already filled with a large amount of chemicals. Regardless of how he died though, there was now a massive void in leadership from the business side of things. Not only was Brian Epstein normally the guy who scheduled the Beals on appearances, but he served as the intelligent business advisor as a whole. Remember that without Brian Epstein, the Beals wouldn't have even gotten a shot at recording with George Martin at EMI. As John Lennon would later remark, I knew we were in trouble then. So without Brian Epstein, what was next? Who was going to lead the Beals now, just after what they achieved with Sgt. Pepper? The answer, Paul McCartney. Now this was naturally an intelligent choice, because Paul was always the guy who would call the other Beals when there was a new album to record and so on. But in this case, he's not only leading them in album sessions, he's leading them creatively as a whole. With George's mind being on India, John's mind being pretty much everywhere and anywhere, and Ringo eventually getting filmic commitments and various roles in projects himself, it was up to Paul to find a way to recapture that group synergy that they had back in the touring days. The answer Paul came up with was Magical Mystery Tour. This project is really one of the most peculiar things the Beals ever came up with. A film about going on a magical tour had potential, but how would it be executed? This is where the film comes into play. It's not a hard day's night or even help in terms of how it was put together. For starters, it was a TV movie rather than a theatrical one. This meant that Richard Lester, the director of the past two films, wasn't involved. This is where skeptics of the film start to realize that this film might just break the boundaries of what makes a good film itself. None of the Beals had ever produced a film on their own, and the reason there was no film in 1966 itself was because of the lack of good scripts and ideas they were getting. Now all of a sudden, they're the writers, producers, and directors themselves. Here's where it gets even more mind-boggling. You know how most films have a script that the actors follow? I mean, it makes sense, right? How can you just have a bunch of actors improvise a 90-minute production? That's a rhetorical question, but not to Paul and crew. That's right, this entire film was non-scripted. Instead, it was scripted, which basically meant that the film was organized around a collection of ideas and sketches. Did nobody see the problem with this? I get that the Beals were all about the concept of breaking rules and boundaries, but this is literally filmmaking 101. When you don't have a scripted film, you end up getting a lot of scenes that don't really amount to anything. And worst of all, you don't get much of a story. The biggest problem with this film really is the lack of story. It's just a bunch of scenes that vaguely tie into this magical mystery tour. The way they transition to these scenes might be the worst part actually. I mean you'll be watching the passengers on the bus when all of a sudden we're taken to a field and they're racing for some reason. Okay then we go back inside the bus as normal and then all of a sudden we're in a scene about wizards. Th there's just no comfortable flow to this film and the more you try to understand it, the more confused you'll end up getting. The first two Beals films did have a lot of quick and unusual parts to them that would lead you nowhere, but they were put together much better than what we got here. The scenes also progress so slowly, and about 80% of them just drag on for way too long. Some of them even ruin the jokes that they have set up. Take for example the general who talks in gibberish. The scene starts off really funny because you don't expect it at all. Then the general keeps talking and talking and talking 
I don't. Oh my God! Can you just leave now? Speaking of the jokes, this film is significantly less funny than the first two films. It's amazing because the Beatles really got funnier as they matured, but aside from your typical visual gags and facial expressions that are still priceless to this day, there's not much comedy in this one that you'll really remember. As a Beatles fan, of course I'll remember a ton of scenes, but if you had no idea about the Beatles and you watched this, you'd pretty much just be bored throughout the film. Mainly because aside from the four Beatles, Val Evans and Ringo's aunt, there's not really much development for the other characters we get. The bus crew only act enthusiastic and really nothing more. The old man only has one scene really dedicated to him that drags on for way too long. And everyone else is just there, really. The first two films definitely emphasize the Beatles, don't get me wrong. But in A Hard Day's Night, a ton of minor characters got a ton of memorable dialogue, while in Help, the villains were developed and interesting contrasts. Since there's not really a conflict in this film, there's no villain to focus on, and since the minor characters barely do anything, there's no way you'll even remember them. Yeesh is this film flawed. The best part about this film that we can all universally agree on are the music videos. All of them are really interesting and the visuals perfectly capture the tonality of the songs. For example, Fool on the Hill just features shots of Paul alone, I Am the Walrus features a ton of psychedelic and crazy imagery, while Your Mother Should Know, which is my personal favorite sequence, has a much more danced hall styled visual. Obviously the songs themselves are also the highlights because if there's one thing you'll never question about the Beatles, it's the music. We even get an appearance from the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band that sets up the final song Your Mother Should Know, which as I mentioned is really a perfect finale to the film and leaves you with a really good taste in your mouth. Regarding the film itself, I can at least give props to the visuals. The effects are quite interesting and the film itself is very pleasant to look at if you're watching in color. When all said and done though, this film was quite a flop for the Beatles. The film was intended to be shown off in color, but because color TVs weren't quite yet stable at the time, many UK audiences just saw the film in black and white. And oh man, can't even make it through some of these dragged out scenes in color. Imagine it in black and white. The reaction was so bad, Paul McCartney actually had to apologize in a press release of, about the film. If you think I'm being harsh here, the critics in 1967 were even worse. That being said, this film is still important in the Beatles' history. Not only would it be the last unified film ever made by them, but its reception would be the start of their internal downfall. But the bottom line is that I still do enjoy this one occasionally, despite all the flaws I mentioned. And for a first effort, it was quite ambitious and you at least have to give Paul and the crew props for trying. With the film now looked at, let's talk about the album. This is a really interesting album, and a few of you might be wondering why I'm even considering it part of the Beatles studio canon. Well for starters, it does contain a lot of original material. In fact, it was originally released as an EP in the UK, which is a cassette containing around 5 songs. Due to the fact that EPs usually sell horribly in America, the tracks from the EP were added onto a vinyl along with all the singles released that year, which included the Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane of Layside, the All You Need Is Love single, and the Hello Goodbye single. As a result, just from looking at the track list, you might be thinking, this album is quite stacked. And you aren't wrong in thinking that, but at the same time, just note that an album is a bit more than just the tracks that it has. It's also about how well the album flows together and whether or not it's collectively a great unit altogether. But going back to the history though, this album is actually the first instance of a Beatles studio album that was only available in America for a while. As such, we see a capital label on the record instead of a parlophone, which actually will not appear again after its appearances from Please Please Me to Sgt. Pepper, with the formation of the Apple label in the following year. The UK would have to wait until 1976, nine years after the original release, until the LP version of Magical Mystery Tour was re released there, which would end up being in fake stereo. Yeah, this album has quite a strange history both release-wise and film-wise, but now that you know the history of this album, let's physically take a look at the LP itself. Compared to the past 8 albums we've seen, this LP is absolutely a giant. Its cover is a bit of a step down from the past two iconic album covers with Revolver's black and white mashup and Sgt. Pepper's colorful and popular band. 
We do see the Beatles dressed as their animal costumes from the I Am The Waller sequence in the film. So hey, if you're a fan of that, then I guess you'll really like the cover. What I really like is the back cover. What an amazing effect they used on the Your Mother Should Know sequence. The effect actually ties in with that dream sequence effect from the film. Similar to Sgt. Pepper, we have a gatefold that contains lyrics from the songs in the film on the right side, and the track lifting and background description of the film on the left. You might be asking though, wait, page 7 or 8? What's that supposed to mean? Well, well, this album comes with a booklet that's essentially a tie-in with the film. This booklet, folks, is probably the best part of any packaging I've ever seen. Bob Gibson, the man in charge of the drawings, put a ton of effort into these absolutely fabulous illustrations. If you haven't seen the film yet and don't really want to slog through it, this booklet basically has you covered. How can a booklet that just served as an extra to the LP be a much more effective product than the actual film? Alright, alright, I'll stop ripping the film now. This booklet has a ton of amazing photographs from the set itself, and honestly, when I ordered the Beatles box set, I was most happy with this LP itself. All I can say is, this album's packaging might be my favorite of them all. Even more than Sgt. Pepper's, by the way. Now, the booklet was originally stapled to the album itself, but in the box set edition that I got, it's its own separate thing, which I honestly prefer. I can only imagine them back in the day. I bet they were thinking you'd have your Magical Mystery Tour t-shirt with your Magical Mystery Tour record in the turntable with your booklet in hand as you you're ready to watch the film. Yeah, uh, maybe not me. Anyways, here's the record, which has the Rainbow Capital label that was also the same for the Beach Boys Pet Sounds record. This is the case because both bands used Capital as their record company. With the LP design now looked at though, let's actually take a listen to Magical Mystery Tour. We start this LP off with, well, Magical Mystery Tour. This makes it back-to-back -back albums with the title track for the first and only time in the Beatles discography. This song is a prime example of a Paul McCartney composition because it really checks off all the boxes of his checklist. For starters, Paul McCartney songs generally have amazing melodies, and sure enough, this song is probably the best one on the album. That roll up for the mystery tour line is repeated so many times that it just gets stuck in your head along with the fantastic orchestra and chorus. What I like most about this song though is that it just gets you so excited for the rest of the album. It's even more powerful in the film because it hypes up everything and makes you thrilled for what's next. Sure, the lyrics don't really offer much aside from just telling you how lit this magical mystery tour is, but I think it really does its job. One of my favorite parts that I have to point out is that ending. After the last sequence of a repeat of the hook, we get a sudden eerie change as the instruments settle down and we, set, we instead get a piano outro that sets the stage for the next song on the album. It's amazingly well done, serving as a brilliant transition, and personally, this is probably my favorite title track of any album so far. While I wouldn't say it's a better song quality-wise than A Hard Day's Night, Help, or even Sgt. Pepper, it's certainly a much more addicting song from a melody standpoint. This one is definitely good. It carries the tradition of fantastic title tracks that the Beatles seem to perfect. Up next is The Fool on the Hill, which is surprisingly written by Paul McCartney. With all the brilliant love songs and breakup songs that Paul has written over the years, who would have thought that he would take on the topic of loneliness and isolation? Well, it's not quite as dark and depressing as I thought it would be, but the song is certainly a contrast from the last song. Instead of simplistic lyrics, we get a really fantastic set of amazing lines that were actually referring to Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, according to Paul. The concept of the song alone is really what makes it so brilliant. We're so quick to assume that the fool is the one who's mad and everyone else is sane, but what if it's the opposite? Aside from the brilliant lyrics we get here, we also get a really nice performance from the flutes that are conducted by George Martin. 
They create a really soothing and lonely environment that complement Paul's great vocal performance to perfection. Paul's voice is actually probably the best part because it's very unique. They made his voice higher pitched like in When I'm 64, but the tone of his voice kind of resembles a young follower who's isolated himself for believing in this fool. This one really is one of those Beatles songs that sound completely unique from everything else. There's not much guitar on this track that you can hear on the mix, and it really has a unique composition to it with both the lyrics and structure being one of a kind for Paul McCartney. For that reason, it's hard not to call this one good. It's an absolutely fantastic piece of music that is probably one of the most impressive songs Paul wrote from a lyrical standpoint. Next we have Flying, the first instrumental to appear on a studio album by the Beatles, and the very first Beatles song released on a studio album to be credited to all four of the members. That being said, this one is really tough to judge. It's got an amazing beat to it that kind of gets stale after 50 seconds of repetitiveness. The track does change though as it progresses slightly, with harmonies by the Beatles coming in as well as a nice Mellotron melody. But as a whole, this one really doesn't actually do much for me. It's one of those tracks that could really only fit within the context of the film itself, rather than an tr actual track on a Beatles album. Now it's not like I'm against instrumentals altogether. After all, the Beach Boys Pet Sounds had two of them. The difference though is that the two instrumentals on Pet Sounds were radically unique and different from the other tracks. With this song, the only thing I'll really come back to it for is that amazing beat. It's really just okay for me, but still a song that I really love in the context of this album. I mean, when you look at this one critically though, it really falls short of the quality of some of the other songs on this album, I'd say. Following suit is a George Harrison composition, Blue Jay Way. This song is probably one of the most complex things ever put together by the Beatles. For starters, it's almost like a progressive song in its composition. The amount of studio effects they used here is really comparable to Tomorrow Never Knows or Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. We're talking about stuff like flanging, artificial double tracking, and a return of the tape loops that were last heard in Mr. Kite. It's one of those songs that you couldn't imagine ever being performed live due to the sophisticated nature of it. A song like this can only really be captured in the studio, and as a result, it really blossoms from it. Everything here is very psychedelic and hazy. The Hammond organ turns into a drone, and it's really what starts the haziness of the track, while the orchestra sounds like it's coming from another universe because of how unique the sound is. The biggest challenge of this song is how monotonous it is though, because George Harrison's vocal performance isn't exactly going to drop your jaw or anything. It does, however, add to the psychedelia of this one, and it's really enjoyable personally. The fact that this song was just about Derek Taylor, the Beatles PR guy, getting lost in LA is really mind-boggling because it does seem to sound way more cosmic than it should. What's most amazing about this song is that it's actually the last Flower Power Beatles song ever recorded. In fact, George Harrison was criticizing LSD and the Height Asbury cult counterculture just days after the song was recorded. Go figure, huh? As for this song, it's certainly a good song. And I'll admit that if you don't like monotonous songs, this one might test your patience, but the beauty of the musicianship and production are really what shines for me here. I think that while it's not a standout composition by the band as a whole, it really shows off George Harrison's vision as a songwriter because when you think about it, this must have been quite challenging to put together. The 
the film sequence also really painted the song perfectly, with George Harrison sitting crisscross to then be reflected in a kaleidoscopic fashion. It sure paid off, didn't it? Let's all get up and dance to a song that was a hit before your mother was born. Oh, she was born a long, long time ago. Your mother should know. Up next is Your Mother Should Know by Paul McCartney, which is his third and final song to appear in the film. Now this song always puzzled me when I first heard it because I had no idea what it was about. I always heard Paul McCartney mention that he was trying to comment on the generation gap thing, but the lyrics don't quite reflect that too well. Regardless of what the words mean though, this song is a musical masterpiece of sorts. If you ever wondered what would happen if the dancehall oriented song meshed with psychedelia, well, you'd get your answer with this one, and man, is this one really addictive. The biggest star here is that instrumental interlude with a piano and an organ simultaneously playing a couple bars of a really fantastic melody. What's also fantastic here is Paul McCartney's vocal performance, which is, once again, at its best. In the final verse of the song, he just sings right along with the instrumental accompaniment and creates another memorable hook with this one. It's amazing because this one really does sound like a consequential song in the Beatles' discography, but it manages to shine so much that by the end of listening to it, you can't help but get the song stuck in your head. It's enjoyable, it's fun, and it has the best music video in the actual film itself. This one is not only a good song, but it's easily my favorite Paul McCartney written song to this point. The amount of fun you'll have listening to this one might very well also have you nodding your head along to this genius melody. Last song to appear in the film is I Am The Walrus by John Lennon. Now technically this song appears before both Your Mother Should Know and even before Blue Jay Way, but I'm sure that Capital knew that this song was the highlight of the film, so they just saved it for the last track of Side 1. Now this one might very well be the ultimate psychedelic masterpiece by John Lennon from all three categories. It takes the psychedelic tone of She Said She Said and Tomorrow Never Knows, but it also combines it with the innocence of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. While the last three songs I mentioned have a lyrical structure to them, this one has little to no connection with its lyrics from one verse to another. That's because John intentionally wanted to write a piece that would confuse the listeners after he heard that teachers were actually assigning dissection of Beale's lyrics. If you ever wondered what a Beale song written while on acid sounds like, well, look no further than this one. John took acid and wrote a part of it on one weekend, then took acid again and wrote another part of it on another weekend, then just meshed the two together. The point is, the lyrics are so strange and incoherent that if you even try to put the meaning together, you'll be stuck in limbo for all eternity. It's essentially the Bohemian Rhapsody and Stairway to Heaven of all lyrics. That being said, there are still a ton of amazing allusions in the lyrics that you can definitely spot. It references Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds in a verse, and it also mentions popular 60s icons such as the Hare Krishna movement and even the mundane things like police sirens and weather. There might not be any flow to the lyrics, but there's still definitely actual things mentioned there. Lyrics aside, this song is essentially another Blue Jay way music-wise, except it replaces the monotonous parts with a lot of eerie and experimental noises. For example, we hear a lot of radio effects in the background, and the bridge itself has a sound effect of turning the radio dial. Speaking of the bridge, by the way, I absolutely love the melody that almost sounds Middle Eastern with its tone. The melody as a whole here is incredibly catchy for a Lennon song, and with all the lyrical mismatch, the song certainly sounds amazingly good, and certainly fun as a whole. It's incredibly trippy, psychedelic, and at times, incredibly hard to understand. It's definitely a good song, and the defining psychedelic composition of the film in my eyes. We start side 2 off with Hello Goodbye, a Paul McCartney composition. 
Now, speaking of melodies that I've constantly been praising Paul on so far, this one might just be the king of them. Everything about the lyrics here is pretty much made to stir up one of the all-time greatest melodies in a song. The musicianship here is still your typical psychedelic Beatles tune, with an orchestra, sounding processed, and a screeching guitar with an overall feel to a song that you'd normally expect from Pepper. In fact, the music video to this song does show the Beatles dressed in their Pepper gear, so this one wouldn't really be out of place on an album like that. So, something I feel that gets overlooked here though is Ringo Starr's drumming performance because he adds a ton of personality to his fills during the bridge. I think his drumming actually carries the song on his shoulders because of how much support he gives the verses and chorus. The true star here though is Paul McCartney, mainly because his vocals create another powerful hook that will immediately grab you and refuse to put you down. It's really another song that will get stuck in your head and for that reason, it was really natural that this one got to number one on the charts. While John did load the fact that I Am The Walrus ended up as the b-side to this song, I can see why a song like this with a more commercial appeal to it would be the dominant figure. It's not better than Walrus quality wise but it's still a really fantastic song that Paul McCartney really took charge of. At long last, it's finally time to talk about Strawberry Fields Forever. Now this song was recorded before the Sgt. Pepper sessions and was released on an album nearly a year later. What's really telling to me about this one was that it's actually written right after She Said She Said was recorded, which in case you forgot, had a section in the song talking about how everything was right during childhood. She said you don't understand what I said, I said no, 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 you're wrong. After the song was recorded and Lennon was filming How I Won the War, his off time was spent reminiscing about childhood and sure enough, wrote a, he decided to write a song about it that turned into Strawberry Fields Forever. Now this is a song that's truly unlike anything else in the Beatles discography. If there existed such a thing as having an adventure as you listen to a song, then Strawberry Fields Forever pretty much exemplifies that. Every verse in this song sounds completely different than the last. The first verse has a Mellotron backing with some guitar accompaniment and the usual drums. After that verse, we get a gradual intensification of the backing instruments with the entry of George Martin's orchestra, mostly consisting of cellos in this section. They have a really dark tone to them and finally, we get to the second verse with an Indian harp no known as a Swermondo, which appeared on Within Without You, that creates an almost surrealistic transition to a very personal second verse that has Vocals on top of extended trumpets in the background that build sympathy and passion. No one I think is in my tree. I mean, it must be high or low. That is, you can't, you know, tune in, but it's all right. That is, I think it's not too bad. After the second verse comes a very interesting edit made by George Martin and Jeff Emmerich that combine one take with another take despite the difference in pitch and tempo between the two. They did a hell of a job because to this day, I still can't quite spot the exact moment the edit occurs in. Sure, people can easily spot it, but I guess my ears aren't that great or something. Anyways, the third chorus is very powerful with an increased tempo and the addition of trumpets playing quarter notes this time that actually make the last verse more adventurous and poignant than the last. One last chorus later and then we pretty much get an outro that sounds like a nightmarish ending that kind of alludes to a bad LSD trip. Which then finally ends with John saying cranberry sauce, which Paul is dead theorists falsely attribute as I buried Paul. Phew, did you get all that? I mean the musicianship in this song is really adventurous and similar to songs like White Rabbit, Crystal Ship, and heck even the Beatles song got to get you into my life. The instrumentation keeps on changing as the song progresses. And that's why this song really feels like an adventure. And the first time I heard it, every time I heard that Swarmundo, I knew that I was about to hear something completely different. What's so poignant about this song in particular though are the lyrics. 
Not only does the music match them perfectly, but the words to this song are possibly the greatest lyrics of all time. My personal favorite is actually the very first verse, when Lennon proclaims that living is easy with eyes closed. This ties in with that nothing is real and nothing you get hung about sections on the song. And the more you think about the way Lennon sings these lines, it almost reminds you of how insecure the guy was throughout his life. I mean, every single line in the verse is really powerful one way or another, and you'll find yourself relating to at least one of the parts. Adding to the adventurous parts that I did mention are the drastic shifts of tone in the lyrics. The first line I'd highlighted has a slight optimism to it because of the way it describes life before the last two verses both talk about the struggles of it, whether it be the lack of relatability one has with other people or the need to put on a mask and shield your weirdness from others. Now I might be looking too much into these lyrics, but that's exactly what John was trying to do. He claimed in interviews that his song was essentially psychoanalysis set to music because in reality, that's exactly what these lyrics are trying to convey. Now as much as I loved She Said She Said's in the late for its deepness, this song really goes above and beyond with that concept, and I'd say it even tops in my life personally as the most deep and personal song Lennon ever wrote. In the original demo of the song, the way Lennon sung the first two sections of the song really nearly brought a tear to my eye because of how personal it was. No one I think is in my tree. I mean it must be high on love. That is you can't you know children but it's alright. That is I think it's not too bad. If there's any gripes though I do have with this song, the final version does kind of take away from that personal feel of his voice after the first verse. From the second voice on, his voice is heavily double tracked, the point where his voice is actually lower pitched and a bit less raw. It's not a bad vocal performance or anything, but I think it does take away from the beauty of the, his original vocal performance, now that I think of it. When Lennon said in later interviews that the song was poorly recorded, I'd bet he was talking about his vocals here honestly. With all that said though, this song is very much a masterpiece. It's one of the greatest songs not only of the Beals, but of all time for that matter. It's so personal, adventurous, and musically amazing. It really defines John Lennon as a musician, and if it weren't for She Said She Said, this song would easily be my all-time favorite Beatles song. Just wow. Relax, relax, is in my ears, and in my eyes. Following suit is Paul McCartney's Penny Lane. This song you can consider the twin of Strawberry Fields Forever. While it's a twin, the two songs are really only connected via their theme. While John's Strawberry Fields is more pessimistic and surreal as a whole, Paul's Penny Lane is really bittersweet and innocent. It's honestly one of the happiest songs I've ever heard, and listening to it puts you immediately in a good mood because of the power of its tone. The chorus specifically is one of the most powerful mood lifters I've ever heard. What's also powerful is that trumpet solo that also serves as a really good mood swinger and overall the musicianship here is really something exceptional. It's such a beautifully crafted piece and it might be one of the best musically crafted songs ever released. What's also really beautiful are the vocals that are so incredibly cheery and happy. Paul's performance here is very heartfelt, which is similar to songs like For No One, except that in this song's case, it's much more fond. Last but not least, the lyrics are just so brilliantly intelligent. There's a ton of imagery that this song plants in your head, from the roundabout to the barber to the fireman, you name it. It's a song that almost creates a whole universe in your mind because of how much it describes and the perspective that it paints. It's almost like a utopian world of sorts, which is sort of because of the happy-go-lucky nature of the song and the surrealism that this one paints as well. Honestly, this is yet another song that you can really consider as a standout of the Beatles' career. No song to me has been so happy-go-lucky and emotionally compelling as this one and Strawberry Fields Forever. I mean, the two songs really give both sides to the feeling of nostalgia and childhood innocence. This one is easily good and another masterpiece of music.
after two heartfelt and powerful songs, we get a much more down-to-earth and relaxed piece with Baby, You're a Rich Man. This song is a true Paul McCartney and John Lennon collaboration with John being in charge of the verses with Paul and Paul being responsible for the chorus. Now, similar to songs like I Am the Walrus and Your Mother Should Know, the soundscape of this one is quite unique. The most defining feature is that clavioline, which is, which is a really unique hook that shines alongside the verses. The lyrics to this one are definitely something though that does not quite eclipse its era, with the hippie themes being very prevalent here. But the most in interesting aspect here is that the lyrics seem to represent some sort of hidden meaning. It's a very positive message to, su to suggest that all of us are rich and valuable in one way or another, but it does so quite uniquely and in a playful way that the Beatles are obviously really good at. John Lennon never really revealed the true meaning behind this one, but some say that Brian Epstein, the Beatles manager, dropped acid for the first time and John decided to congratulate him in this one. Not only by telling him that he's one of the most, he's one of the beautiful people now, but also by apparently calling him a rich fag Jew during the harmonies. I didn't make that up by the way, John was just that into dark humor and decided to sneak one of those lines in during the harmonies. Obviously with Epstein's death occurring afterwards, Lennon might have regretted saying that. Anyways, I'm just rambling now. This one is certainly a great song. It won't knock your socks off or anything, but its uniqueness and charm is certainly one of its best qualities and something you definitely would return to. with the universal anthem All You Need Is Love by John Lennon. This song is an example of a message that really transcends eras because of how universally true it is. You can be cynical and claim that this message is bogus and way too unrealistic like a lot of people have done, but the main source of happiness does come from love, which is what Lennon's essentially trying to say here. What makes me so happy about this song personally is that it was sung on the Our World broadcast, in which 400 million people saw. Think about that, 400 million people around the world saw the Beatles singing All You Need Is Love. It's such a beautiful message and just so powerful. I haven't even gone to the verses yet. While songs like Strawberry Fields are pessimistic and Penny Lane was optimistic, the song is actually both. It depends on how you interpret it, of course. Genius lyrics aside, the musicianship here is once again very unique and interesting. For starters, it features an intro of the beginning of the French national anthem that serves as the universal connection for every country. As a whole, it, in general, it combines both the, the orchestral ingredients of songs like Your Mother Should Know, with the psychedelic landscape and guitar work of songs like I Am The Walrus and Hello Goodbye to create a heck of a sound. It also follows suit with She Said She Said and Love You Too, featuring a temporary change to another time signature after the first chorus before switching right back. My favorite part personally is the outro with the callback to songs like She Loves You and Yesterday. It's a perfect ending to this album I feel, and a perfect ending to one of the greatest masterpieces of the 1960s. Certainly good, and certainly one of the greatest messages in a song I've ever heard. And that was Magical Mystery Tour. It's certainly an album that leaves you with a great feeling after listening to it. For starters, it's really stacked featuring four songs that I would really consider to define the Beatles as a whole. While three of those songs were released as singles beforehand and not really recorded for the album itself, the flow and feel of the album as a whole still can't be denied. Let's take a look at the album as a whole and we see that 10 of the 11 songs were good with only one okay song which was Flying. And speaking of Flying, it's the first okay song since Run For Your Life from Rubber Soul. So that ends the streak of perfect albums at 2. Even then, it, that doesn't take away from the quality of this one. The songs for the film all had unique timbres to them, and each one contributed something new and refreshing to the Beatles' discography. Album rankings wise, you can see that Magical Mystery Tour is ranked after Revolver, Sgt. Pepper, and Rubber Soul. Now ranking this album was rather difficult, but I think that the overall enjoyment kinda speaks for its ranking. 
Now, Revolver has 14 unforgettable and timeless songs. Sgt. Pepper is as influential as it gets, and Rubber Soul was just an amazing mash of an emergent style and a passing style. But Magical Mystery Tour does have a ton of great moments, though, to justify its position over any of the pre Rubber Soul Beatles albums. Now, song rankings wise, the only one that was ranked rather low was Flying, which is still a really enjoyable song in its own right. The other 10 songs on this album are ranked quite higher up, and as you notice, we have a whopping 4 new entries into the top 20 with I Am The Walrus, Strawberry Fields, Penny Lane, and All You Need Is Love, all being timeless enough to get in. All You Need Is Love and Strawberry Fields both make the top 5, but neither are able to top A Day In The Life, which is still at number 1. At this point though, the top 3 are all songs that are just inches apart from each other quality wise. If Strawberry Fields had slightly better vocal mixing, I could probably guarantee that it would be number 1. Now with all that said and done though, this album was really special. Let's conclude now by taking a look at 3 observations I made throughout the album. First off, this is the very first album since A Hard Day's Night to not have any songs featuring Ringo Starr on lead vocals. Technically you could hear his voice the most on flying, but he doesn't really sing any actual lines there, so I don't think it counts. There's not really much reasoning to why this happened, aside from the fact that there wasn't really any opportunities for him to sing lead. When Ringo sings lead, Paul and John generally know what song is best for his voice, but on this album, I couldn't exactly see a song that would have been better suited for Ringo, honestly. The album's quality isn't that affected by this, but you'll probably be happy to know that Ringo's opportunities will return on the White Album. Next up are the guest stars. If you were paying attention to the personnel sections on the slides, you may have seen a couple of names pop up such as Mick Jagger and, and Marianne Faithful. They have appeared on tracks before such as Yellow Submarine, but this was really the first instance of an album that had more than one appearance by them. They didn't exactly shine because they were in the background, which is why I didn't really talk about them much, but it's still really quite fascinating to see them that they to see that they appeared on several tracks. Last but not least, and probably the most important observation I made, this is the end of the psychedelic era for the Beatles. It's a shame because it really only lasted three albums, but after this album was recorded, all four of the Beatles pretty much renounced psychedelics as a whole, and they geared more towards meditation. The biggest catalyst behind this change was actually George who soon re actually writes a song detailing exactly this, which I'll cover when we get to it. The biggest change though is that there will no longer really be any grand production on a Beatles album from here on out. There won't be hundreds of hours spent in the studio on a single track or anything like that. From now on, the musical landscape of the Beatles is going to actually change more towards hard rock, and just rock in general. For the people who question why the Beatles are called a rock band, well from here on out you're about to find out exactly why. I personally regard the stretch though of Revolver through Magical Mystery Tour as the finest era for the Beatles music wise. I think that Psychedelia really helped create more of an artistic approach for the Beatles music and I think that some of the songs throughout this stretch that I listed on this slide really define the best of how great the creativity was. So as a whole, this whole album was really quite an adventure. The music was experimental and unique while the lyrics were more personal and far more interesting. Now, Magical Mystery Tour may not be considered canon in the Speedle's studio discography to some, but I think it really captures the end of their psychedelic era, as I mentioned, but it also shows a shift towards more of a solo-oriented form of Beatles music. Soon after this album's released, all four Beatles are now going to go through a creative spiral, and for the first time in the band's history, major fights and changes are going to occur that will soon divide the band once and for all. Me next time when I take a look at the album regarded by many as the album that split the Beatles up, The White Album.